labels as well, well as the artists. It sounds like what you're saying, the opportunity for marketers is less about what you kind of hear about, which is, you know, like, for example, you know, uh, you know screw off the, the, the top of the soda and you can go and get a free download on your phone. Uh, and it's much more actually about, you know, interacting through the artist and actually going and saying, come into the retailer and then get some of the music experience at the retailer as opposed to physically getting something for your phone, such as wallpaper or ringtone. Right. I think there, there'll be a piece of transition where that mobile content piece could play an important role. As you get you know, more advanced in capabilities and acceptance of full track downloads and, and music, then there's, then there's newer opportunities. But you know, there's no doubt that a company like Starbucks is changing you know, how people discover music. And in my opinion, uh, as physical product go, uh, goes away, and I'm sure Starbucks and others that are thinking about this are thinking about this, which is, you know, how does that get replaced? And, and I'm definitely convinced that there's a huge role for mobile, you know, the retailer and artist and distribution of music, you know, in that whole environment. And certainly, you know, as a company, we want to continue to try and figure out where we can play a role in that. Now, also, because this is such a new platform, from the artist's perspective, I'm finding from what I'm hearing is that there is not a stigma of associations with certain brands and certain marketers that you used to have five years ago <laughs> simply because the stigma doesn't exist. It's not like it's uh, a TV commercial or a tour sponsorship, all of which has kind of been there, done that, so people form an opinion. But because this is brand new, I think I seem to see from artist perspectives a much more openness to be working with brands uh, a lot more. I, and teens I, are accepting of it as well. I think it depends. I think in the mobile, this idea of interaction between bands and fans on the mobile phone, I think a brand has a great opportunity there to become involved in that uh, connection as long as they can still be, just as they've always had to be, creative in how they participate in that. But if you can get creative and you can find ways as a brand to be part of that and, in, ha in fact, enhance the experience. So maybe... You know, right now, Moses can enable a simple text message from a fan to a band. Uh, but what if that involved, you know, buying your artist a favorite, you know, something out of a store and being able to get that and then knowing that you're, you're having an impact on that artist's personal device or vice versa, the, the artist being able to give out something to their, to their fans where you're actually, as a brand, enhancing that experience. You know, I think those opportunities are huge and I think that it's a win-win for all, all, all parties. Great. We have time for a couple of questions, if there's any questions that we have in the audience. Um, anybody want to discuss right up here up front? How long do you see it until um, more multimedia formats are going to be popular in mobile? You know, it's, it's hard to predict because every year, it seems, since you know, 2004, everyone's saying, oh, this is the year it's going to take off. And you know, I just looked at the M metric stats um, that I have from January of 07, and I was kind of floored by the idea that less than per a percent, like one third of one percent, have downloaded a full track song as of January 07. So that's one in a thousand people that have done that. Um, you know, I, you've got to think that it's, you know, as 3G comes to the United States, certainly globally, we're behind in terms of rich data services. Um, that that's going to happen. But we still have, not only do we have a data access issue and a pricing issue there, but we also have usability issues. You know, there's not enough high quality talent focused on making the usability of the device something that is going to really drive adoption. Um, so from our point of view, as a company that's primarily doing text messaging today with some combination with the internet and the web on the traditional PC, um, you know, we still see a huge opportunity for that in terms of using text messaging as a way, as a primary means over the next 18 months. But that's not to, not to say we won't experiment. So for example, we've had artists send links to mobile videos and we're able to see, okay, sure enough, I guess only 3% of people like to have video on their handsets. And so over time, you can experiment with that and start to build that out and see and kind of go with adoption. Um, but one thing we, of course, like about text messaging and our labels and artists like about it is the fact that you don't have to put the footnote with the call to action that says, hey, if you're on this network and have this phone, you can participate. You can just simply make the call to action happen and have everyone participate. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, Ann Collier with Net Family News. Is this on? Yes. Okay. I was just wondering, how much do you look to Europe and Asia, um, you know, to sort of predict what's going to happen with 3G and media sharing on phones in this country? Young Italians are number one in photo sharing. Um, I read in a, a Europe and North America study. So, you know, do, how much do you look to sort of our market to predict, and how much do you look overseas? 
Yeah, well, at, the, at, at a startup, as we are, it's hard to do a lot of that, like go and learn, and you're kind of in the moment, and you're trying to figure it out. But one of the things I, I did believe going into it was that the nature of broadband and the internet here makes it a very different market in terms of how you even think about your phone. Um, whereas in many cases, you know, certainly in Asia, certainly in, in less developed countries, and to some degree in Europe, it is almost the primary computer. The laptop home computer are there, but they're not as, as critical. Whereas here, it's almost the reverse. It's like, yeah, I'll use my phone to text messages my friends while I'm online, but really my life is online right now. So I think, you know, I think in some ways that means the U.S. has its own set of great opportunities relative to those other countries, and over time you'll see it kind of spread out. Do you see a lot of convergence between what's happening mobily and what's happening online? I mean, are people really, you know, can you use mobile to direct people back online and vice versa? Yeah, well, the, yeah. it's a big thesis for us is that that combination, the idea that I might want to get a piece of mobile content when I'm out in the world, yeah. but I'm actually, I might want to preview it on my phone, but I actually want to consume it in a place where I'm used to, like my TV or, you know, things like that. Certainly, we take a very internet-centric approach to the overall business, although right now we do things like text messaging, but right to the point where if I text back an artist or an artist texts me, that history is safe for me on the internet so that I can, you know, get involved, send it to a friend, do other things like that. So I, I think you'll see the convergence over time. Great. We have time for one last quick question um, right over here. How often, uh, how often do you feel like kids want to hear from you via text messaging? I guess, like, what's the line between... What's the line between harassing somebody with text messages and giving them as right. much as they want? Yeah, well, we're 100% permission-based, so you've opted in to hear from a particular artist. And then it really is, you know, editorial decisions as to what's going to work. And, you know, you see the unsub rates when you see, you know, even when an artist, you know, very well-intentioned spells something wrong and then thinks they have to go and correct it, you know, five minutes later with a second text message, you are going to have a detrimental impact on your overall listener base <laughs> because... You will see, you know, let's say the list is 10,000 people, you'll see 200 people say, okay, I'm done with this person. And, and the reality is that youth are very much, to, unless they've got the parent that said, okay, we'll pay $6 a month, you can have unlimited texting, they do count their messages. And so there is still a finite resource. And even though the trend is clearly towards, you know, all you can eat and all those types of activities, which will probably increase the tolerance of people, that, that intolerance still exists and, and it's important that you kind of figure out what the right pace is. And, and the ones that send, you know, regular but not frequent, so once every couple of weeks, they don't see much churn. Um, but the ones that are like feeling like, oh, they must want to hear from me every four hours, you know, that's a big difference. Do you have any experience with letting people like customize the number of messages that they're getting from you or how often they come in? Uh, we don't see a ton of that. So a lot of our promotions are, you know, even though Moses does serve to aggregate a lot of this activity, you know, most people on our network belong to one or, you know, one kind of connection, if you will. About 10% of our subscribers belong to two or more. Um, and so we have a big vision around the customization of quiet hours and who can contact me and all of that, but that comes with building up the business. Yeah, I think certainly the thing that, thing that I've seen is that because of the cost involved, people are very, very selective and actually what we're finding, I think you probably agree, people who sign up for uh, finding out information about an artist mobily are really true, hard committed fans. They are not going to be somebody casual because they yeah. don't want to waste that. There's a piece of that and then there's a piece that's very telling about who are the artists with following because of that. Because sometimes you'll be, at least in my <laughs> time, amazed that you think, oh, you know, as a company, we're like, oh my goodness, we're going to work with this artist. And it turns out that they don't have a lot of fans that want to hear from them that often, yeah. despite the hype that's out there. Whereas other artists that you're like, oh, okay, cool, we're going to work with them. And wow, they've got a fan base that is just amazing. Wants everything. Dorian, thank you so much thank for you. talking to us today. Dorian Porter, CEO of Moses.